Okay, welcome back uh, everyone. So today is my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, again uh, Ahmed Hussein, who will be uh, resuming the reading group on the dynamics of games. And to, uh, today he'll be talking about asymptotic convergence and performance of multi-agent pure learning dynamics. So thank you, Ahmed. Okay, thank you, Bumadia. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, as Bumadia said, we'll be looking at uh, the multi-agent pure learning dynamics. So pure learning is, essentially one of the foundational uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, the one that we uh, all come across first, um, but it does provide a strong backbone for understanding um, the you know, uh, further reinforcement learning algorithms and really understanding the fundamentals of it. And as Bumadian mentioned, we'll be looking at both convergence. So can we get these uh, this multi-agent system to reach some kind of equilibrium and also how do we assess uh, the performance of the system? Okay. So to, to do this, we're going to start with some uh, bit, a bit of an overview of understanding what learning in games is, what reinforcement learning is, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you who have attended these talks before or have done almost anything in, in reinforcement learning will, of course, have come across Q learning. And so there's going to be a lot of uh, recap for you guys, but uh, we'll also be looking at it from a dynamical perspective. Uh, so there's something new in there for, for everyone. Uh, and the, also those of you who've been in the previous Dynamics of Games talks uh, will no doubt uh, have come across some of these ideas, but we'll be specifically applying it to Q learning. So a little bit of, uh, a little, little bit for everyone. So once we've set the scene a little bit, we can start to talk about some of the results that um, uh, have been found recently regarding Q learning, specifically as the title indicates, uh, to do with convergence and performance of the, the Q learning algorithm. Okay. So we're starting with this lens of multi-agent reinforcement learning. And when I say multi-agent reinforcement learning, I mean you know, we, the basic idea or the basic thesis is that we have multiple autonomous agents, think self-driving cars or game-based agents or, or however you want to think about it. And we'd like to get them to interact. Oh, we could even include humans. If obviously for the first two, we're looking from the point of view of the designer, right? Uh, we're looking to design systems that behave in some optimal manner. Um, but equivalently, we can use these principles to understand economic behavior. Um, and so the things that we'll be talking about today kind of uh, apply to both ends of the spectrum, the design perspective from engineering and the economic perspective as well. So let's uh, set the scene a little bit. Reinforcement learning, multi-agent reinforcement learning has see, seen a lot of practical success so far. Um, if you're following any of DeepMind's work, you'll have seen um, the StarCraft work that they put out not too long ago. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of really, really interesting research going on from the design perspective of multi-agent systems. Okay, The one that I'm showing you at the moment, um, I think is a really nice example, and I'll show you the video for it. It's from a work that was done uh, by OpenAI in which they were training these sets of agents to play hide and seek. Okay, So in this environment, you have uh, two sets of agents, the blues who, whose only goal is to hide, and the reds whose only goal is to find the blue agents, and that's it. Uh, and they're trained to play this game repeatedly. Now, what's interesting about that is that through multiple rounds of training this, the agents are able to learn some pretty complex behaviors, which aren't specifically put in by the, uh, by the designer, right? So for example, the blues are able to learn to block doors. Um, the reds respond to this by using a ramp to get over the walls. But I mean, what's interesting about this isn't necessarily the behaviors themselves, but the fact that the agents are able to learn these behaviors simply by playing the game, right? So a lot of good work in terms of the practice and the design of multi-agent systems. And what we're looking at 
is from the theoretical side, which has a long way to go in order to catch up to the successes of um, implementation. So we're looking at it from the theoretical side to say, okay, can we actually guarantee these behaviors? You know, if we have a multi-agent setting given to us a priori, can we ensure that the behavior that we want is to some extent guaranteed? Yeah. So as I said, we're going to be using the Q learning algorithm as our basis for all of this. Um, if you open up one of the classic texts in reinforcement learning, like uh, Sutton Bato or um, David Barber's book, Q learning will be that, um, and it will be one of the first things that we come across. So it's a good starting point for our analysis. So how does this work? Uh, in this case, we have multiple agents. Let's say, uh, no, let's, let's do it this way. You're one agent and I'm the other, okay? The setting is that I take some action, or let's say you take some action. Um, you take some action I, and I take some action J. So if we take a prototypical example, rock, paper, scissors, you're playing rock, I'm playing paper, right? And now based on both of our actions, you're gonna receive a reward and I'm gonna receive a reward. So if we're playing rock, paper, scissors, you play rock, I play paper, I win, I get a reward, a positive reward, you may get a negative reward, so on and so forth. So that's the setting that we're acting in. By the way, if at any point there are any questions, please just interrupt me. Um, if I either just not explain something, uh, very well, or uh, if there's any more conceptual questions, just interrupt, um, and I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, so what are we interested in? We're interested in understanding the probability with which any given agent plays their action. Okay, and we're going to monitor that using XKI. That's what, how we're going to label it. So. XKI is the probability with which agent K, agent K plays action I. So in this example, it could be, you know, the probability with which you play rock uh, or the probability with which I play scissors, something like that. Now, how does Q learning suggest that we update uh, the, these probabilities? Well, what it requires is that each agent keeps a track of the so-called Q value of each action. This is essentially a measure of perceived value um, of any given action. What it does is we play the game repeatedly. Right? We play rock, paper, scissors, for example. And every time you play rock, you receive a reward and you keep track of whether you've won more often playing rock or you've lost more often playing rock uh, and so on and so forth. And so you can see here, this is just a simple weighted update where the update is based on the reward. So this is the reward to agent K for playing action I. Okay, so we update our Q value and then we use that Q value to determine uh, the probability with which we're going to play actions. And so we're going to take this from a Boltzmann distribution, which essentially allows us to say things that have performed well in the past, let's uh, play them more often, and things that have performed not as well, let's play them less often. And the degree to which or the harshness to which you control that is all determined by this parameter t and um, this parameter i refer to often as the temperature just because i'm from more of a physics background so i'm used to calling it temperature um, but we'll see in a second that there are other names and interpretations for temperature but essentially if, you, if we think about it from a softmax perspective this uh, temperature will just monitor the harshness of the softmax so that if we set temperature all the way down to zero then we're choosing the highest performing or the the, the 
action with the highest Q value every single time, right? With 100% probability. Whereas if we start increasing the, um, the temperature, then we start to get a much softer softmax so that we're now including actions that don't have as high of a Q value and we're able to actually sample those as well, okay? And um, now what we can look at from, uh, I've already drawn on this, uh, on this slide is the effect of this temperature parameter, okay? So in this, what the authors are doing uh, and the references are always down at the bottom. But what they're doing essentially is they're taking an initial condition and they're iterating the Q learning algorithm on it and they're plotting the probabilities with which an action is chosen. So for example, this could be like a coin flipping game, right? And on the y-axis is the probability with which agent one plays heads. And on the x-axis is the probability with which agent two plays heads, okay? And so we start the Q learning algorithm with some initial condition and iterate it along and eventually these initial conditions converge to some kind of not necessarily fixed point because this is a discrete stochastic algorithm, but um, close enough. Now, what's interesting is that as you move from these pictures um, left to right, what we're doing is we're, or what the authors were doing in this particular study is decreasing temperature, okay? So they're making this softmax harsher or stricter in the Q learning algorithm. And what that results in is an adjustment of where that fixed point is, okay? So the agents are still converging to a fixed point. The fixed point is just moving uh, essentially as we decrease the temperature parameter until eventually it lands in one of the corners of the simplex, okay? So clearly, temperature has some kind of effect on the behavior of the algorithm. And, and what we'd like to do is understand this. Um, we we wanna know a priori, what does temperature do to the fixed point? How does it affect the landing dynamic, okay? Just before I continue, are there any questions on the preliminaries regarding Q learning? No, okay. So now we're moving into the analysis side of things. So we're leaving the realms of design and looking at theory and we need to say, all right, we need some tools to analyze uh, Q learning with. And luckily game theory and online learning are both fields which have existed for a long time that analyze um, adaptive behavior in multi-agent settings, okay? Now they may not specifically be looking at Q-learning because that's more of a modern algorithm, but they still have the tools ready uh, for us to analyze. So those of you who've uh, attended some of these talks or heard Sebastian's talks uh, at any point will of course have come across evolutionary game theory. This is essentially saying, okay, we, need, we have some continuous time dynamics which act on a game, okay? And the whole thesis of evolutionary game theory is to analyze the behavior of these continuous dynamics on the, the games as given, all right? So th this gives us a very good starting point for our analysis, but what we need, what, what we started with was a discrete time algorithm. What we need in order to use the tools from uh, evolutionary game theory is a continuous time dynamic. So what the authors of uh, this paper do is they actually derive that. Um, and so they approximate the Q learning algorithm as a discrete, uh, sorry, a deterministic continuous time system. And they arrive at this ODE, okay? Um, this is what we're, going to be referring to as the Q or multi-agent Q learning dynamic. Most of the time I just abbreviate that to Q learning dynamic. Okay. 
Um, I'm actually going to return to this slide in a second, but before I do, just in case uh, you, you want to see this behavior in action, what the authors of that paper do is if we return to our two player, two player two action example where we run the Q learning algorithm and we compare that with the phase plot generated by the Q learning dynamic on the same game, then we can see a pretty strong match for the, the predictions made by the phase plot corresponding to the actual behavior of the algorithm. Okay. And in the same way that we saw that the fixed point is changing uh, along the Q learning dynamics when we adjust the temperature, so is the prediction of the phase portrait. Okay, so this does work. So having established that it does work, let's actually analyze it a little bit and see what's going on under the hood. Okay. So there are two parts to this dynamic. There's the left-hand side and the right-hand side, okay? What's interesting um, is that the left-hand side, this part here, has a term that depends on the rewards, okay? Whereas as you can see on the right-hand side, there is nothing to do with the rewards there whatsoever. Um, and the reason for that is that this dynamic is essentially modeling an agent's tendency to maximize their payoff while simultaneously trying to explore their strategy space, okay? So again, if we're playing the rock, paper, scissors example, I could, if, if rock performed very, very well, I, we played one round and rock did very well. I could keep playing rock and hope that that maximizes my payoff. Or I could try a different action. Um, and uh, maybe I switch to paper and see whether that actually performs better than rock. So I have the option of sampling my strategy space. I have the option of maximizing my payoff. This is commonly referred to as the exploration exploitation problem. And that's gonna be a big theme of what we're talking about today. But let's see how this dynamic actually maps that. Okay. So if we have a look at the left hand side, what this is saying is it's comparing, in fact, let me write this out. Uh, and I'm just gonna uh, not include the brackets for the time being. So this first part is the payoff or the reward for playing action I, right? And what we're doing is we're comparing it to the average payoff across all of my actions, okay? So I'm multiplying the probability uh, of playing some action with its reward, adding all of those up, so I'm getting the expectation. And what this is saying is that if the reward to playing uh, of playing action I is greater than the ex my expected reward across my entire strategy space, then this part is positive. And what that means is if we, and in fact, we don't need to ignore that part. Um, since this part is positive, then the time derivative of playing that action is positive. So if the if action I is performing better than the expected reward, then I should play action I more often or with a higher probability, yeah? So this side essentially just tries to maximize payoff. What about the second side? We could go into this in a little bit more depth and I think, do we have time? Uh, yeah, we do. We have a lot of time to do that. If we write this out, let's uh, expand this out a little bit. So this is, I'm taking the sum across my entire strategy space. So if this is rock, paper, scissors, I'm doing this for rock, paper, and scissors. Um, and let's just write out 
and distribute the sum. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, actually, let's just focus on this term here. This term here is an entropic term, right? And what we're doing is we're essentially comparing it to the individual action I. So in essence, this part is an entropy maximizing component. What it basically requires that the agent do is play the play the actions as randomly as possible. Okay, so there's two components. Maximize your payoff and maximize your randomness. And all of that is going to be controlled by this temperature parameter. So that if my temperature is zero, then I'm only maximizing payoff. And if my temperature is tending to infinity, then I'm maximizing entropy, i.e. I'm playing my actions completely randomly. Okay, does that make sense? Are there any questions on the dynamic? No, okay. Um, okay, I've been referring to T as temperature uh, for a while, but there are two other interpretations of it. One of them comes from multi-agent reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning in general, um, and that is the exploration rate of the agent. So what the exploration rate interpretation basically says is, if I increase temperature, then my agent is just sampling actions randomly. So it's exploring all its, its space of possible action. Yeah. Um, whereas if my exploration rate is low, then it's not exploring the state space at all. Let's compare that to another interpretation, which comes from economics, which says that T is the bounded rationality. And you, you'll see both of these terms come up in the literature quite often, the exploration rate and the bounded rationality of the agent. So where does this interpretation come from? Well, it basically it, it stems from saying that if the agent's temperature was zero, then the agent would only be maximizing payoff. Yeah. And from an economic perspective, the interpretation is that a purely rational agent just seeks to maximize their payoff, and that's it. Right? So by adding in this temperature parameter, you're saying that the agent wants to maximize their payoff, but they sometimes make the wrong decision because they're uh, maximizing entropy. And so T represents how irrational they are essentially, um, which is why where the term bounded rationality comes from. Okay. So it, this T parameter, as you may have noticed, is gonna form the backbone of this entire talk and most of the results that stem from the q learning dynamics. We are interested in how the rationality or the exploration rate affects the behavior of the agents. Um, so skipping past this, we've looked for a second at how changing the temperature parameter, I'm going to keep calling it temperature because um, it's, it rolls off the tongue very easily, but uh, you can consider it as exploration rate bounded rationality, however you choose to. So we've seen how changing the temperature causes a fixed point to move. What we've, what we've also seen in the experiment is that the Q-learning dynamic, just like any non-linear dynamical system, does not have to converge to an equilibrium. In fact, generally, it doesn't. So I may just, it behaves. Here, here yeah. just to be too, too small here. So I think maybe can you increase the, yeah, okay. Sure. Yeah, I mean, even the previous, um, I don't know, maybe it was just for me, but uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's, yeah that's, okay. that's much better. better? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, okay, we'll, we'll go from here. So the Q-learning dynamic, just like any other dynamic, does not need to converge to an equilibrium. It can display these 
limit cycle like behaviors, or not limit cycle like, they are limit cycles. Um, and it can also display chaotic behavior. Okay. Um, but what we see again is that by changing, this time increasing the temperature parameter as we move from left to right, that our system seems to be moving from these limit cycles, these non convergent behaviors. And when I say non convergent, I specifically mean non fixed point behavior. Um, we're not considering limit cycle behaviors as convergent. So let's, let's say non equilibrium behaviors. So we move from these non equilibrium behaviors towards fixed points. Okay. And so a natural question to ask is, is this a general phenomenon? You know, if we keep increasing the temperature, will we eventually get to a fixed point? Or does it only occur in a certain subset of games? And so one of the first results, this is our question, do we actually achieve an equilibrium regardless of the game? Or do we need to focus, or does better question is, are there subsets of games or specific multi-agent settings in which no matter what your temperature parameter is, the system will always be, uh, will never equilibrate, okay? And the first theorem that we have from this study is essentially saying no. It's saying that no matter what, game you choose you give me whatever game it is there is a lower bound on the temperature such that as long as the exploration rate is set above this lower bound the q learning dynamics will reach an equilibrium and not only will they reach an equilibrium they'll reach a unique one okay so that no matter what my initial conditions are going to be i can always guarantee conversions to the same equilibrium now, from a design perspective, you can see that this is quite a strong result. This is quite a useful result because it means that we can uh, place some a priori guarantees on our system and that those guarantees do not depend on the initial condition. Okay, so that multiple practitioners can take the same system, set their uh, temperature parameters to the same amount, and they can actually ensure that the behavior uh, will be achieved or the desired behavior will be achieved, okay? So what is this lower bound? It depends on two things. Number one, the number of agents, okay? So it's saying that if we increase the number of agents in the system, then convergence will be harder. Uh, we'll have to set our temperature parameter even higher in order to achieve convergence, okay? And then we have this other, parameter delta, uh, delta is what's referred to as the influence bound. And the technical details aren't super important. What is important is that the influence bound measures in some sense, the size of the game. So what does it say? So let's say, for example, we are playing rock, paper, scissors you're playing rock and I'm playing scissors. Okay, so currently you are winning. Now let's imagine that I change my behavior. Uh, I now start playing paper as would be the smart thing for me to do. And you just continue playing rock. Suddenly you've gone from a situation where your rewards were positive to where they're negative. So, in a sense, what I've done is I have influenced, by changing my action, I have influenced your reward. And the influence bound measures exactly that. It's the maximum influence any agent has over another agent's reward. Okay, so that if we have somehow 10 people playing rock, paper, scissors, if one person changes their action, then what is the maximum influence they have on another agent's reward? Okay. So these two parameters, the size of the game measured by the influence bound and the number of agents. And what this is saying is that if we either have a game with a lot of agents or 
we have uh, a game with which in which each agents have a strong influence on one another, then it's harder to achieve equilibrium. Okay. And, and so we have to set our temperature parameter even higher. But the nice thing is that we do have a lower bound. Um, and that means a practitioner can come in and go, okay, this is what I need to set my exploration rate to so that my agents will always converge in equilibrium. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, there is also, a if there, yeah. Ah, sorry, Bob. It's okay. The question has been answered. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if there are any questions, ah, okay, I see you put it in the chat. Uh, okay, if there are any that are in the chat, then if in the end you could just um, let me know and then I can, I can check it from there. Okay, so uh, now, where are we? Okay, we've understood that to some degree, we can take a non-convergent system or sorry, a non-equilibrating Q-learning dynamic and set the exploration rate high enough so that the agents converge to an equilibrium. I just wanna linger on that point for two minutes and, and try and consider it from a more intuitive perspective. Okay, so I, I mentioned before that there's two interpretations of T, the exploration rate and the bounded rationality. Okay. Um, from my perspective, at least, at least this is my opinion, that uh, if we consider this as, we consider T as just the exploration rate, what does this result tell us, this theorem uh, that we have from before, what does this tell us? That if, the agents explore their strategy space enough, then they will converge to an equilibrium. That doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense, right? Uh, it's true uh, from all uh, from the definitions, but it doesn't intuitive. There's no intuitive grasp, but at least for me. Similarly, if we think about this in terms of bounded rationality, what this is saying from an economic perspective is, if the agents are sufficiently irrational then the, they will converge to an equilibrium. Again, it doesn't roll off the tongue so easily. So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about it from a slightly different perspective um, in, or um, more from a different interpretation of what the temperature actually means, okay? Um, and what we're gonna do to look at that is let's go back to yeah, let's go back to the q learning dynamic itself. Okay, so we said there are two parts to this, the payoff maximizing part and the entropy maximizing part. And what I'm gonna offer as a third interpretation of the temperature parameter is, let's call it the selfishness or a measure of the selfishness of the agent. The reason why I suggest that as uh, an interpretation is because what it's saying is that if we set our temperature really, really low, the agents are just interested in maximizing their own payoff and that's it. But if we start to increase the temperature, then what the agents are doing is they're starting to care less and less about their own payoff. Now suddenly it makes, at least to me, a little bit more clear as to why the agents are converging converging because they care about their payoff less. It's as though three people decide that they want to, they're trying to decide what to eat for dinner that evening. If they're all saying different things and they're adamant that whatever they want has to happen, it's going to be very difficult for them to reach an equilibrium. But the moment the three of them say, I really don't mind. Um, and uh, I, I really don't mind about maximizing my payoff. We can eat whatever. It's very easy to just pull up a random number generator between one and three and then go to whichever one uh, comes out from there. So now it's suddenly a lot easier for them to reach an equilibrium. So that's why I 
offer selfishness or a measure of selfishness. Actually, um, there's probably a better name for this. I just haven't thought of one yet. Um, I, that's why I offer that as an interpretation of what temperature is, because I think it makes uh, why convergence is occurring a little bit more intuitive. Okay. Uh, are there any questions on that result? Is there is a question on the chat? Yeah. Ah, let me have a look. Oh, okay. I haven't been keeping the chat open. Okay. Suppose the rewards are generated from some reward function that is either not Lipschitz or Lipschitz. How does this affect the? Ah, um, how does this affect the choice of t? Would the gain be effectively larger than? Ah, uh, so perhaps and correct me if I'm wrong. You're referring to the influence bound of the gain. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a big assumption that a big assumption that we made when we were deriving this result is that the influence bound is bounded. Um, if the reward functions are non-Lipschitz, uh, then it, there's a sense in which it not it isn't necessarily gonna uh, the influence bound isn't necessarily going to be unbounded, but it could be. Um, and so yes, there's the potential for the gain to be larger if the reward functions are non-Lipschitz. Uh, it's a lot easier. Um, and the analysis ends up working out a lot nicer when the reward functions are Lipschitz. I hope that does answer your question. Let me know if it doesn't. Yeah, okay. Be interested to understand what it is you're, you're seeing but maybe we can uh, chat offline about that. Um, okay, are there any other questions? No, okay. I have a question. Ah, yes. Uh, when you say equilibrium, what do you mean by equilibrium? What is the temperature of equilibrium in that case? So when I say equilibrium, I mean that the agents are eventually converging to some kind of fix, or the dynamic is converging to some kind of fixed point. Okay. Um, are you asking what the nature of the equilibrium is? Yes, but I'm interested interested to know what is the final temperature for all the agents. Do they have a uh, unique of the same temperature at the end? They don't necessarily need to. All that we require is that whatever the minimum is, it's above this lower bound, okay? So the temperature is something uh, that the practitioner sets. So typically when we're designing reinforcement learning algorithms, we set the exploration rate uh, to whatever we want the exploration rate to be. So we have control over this. So the practitioner has the option of setting the um, temperatures for all agents to be the same. And generally in my experiments, that's the way that I do it, but it's not required. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Okay. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Um, all right. So we've seen that the exploration rate has an effect on the ability for Q learning to equilibrate. Okay. So now we're going to try and understand this to in a little bit more depth. There was some quite interesting work that was done in this paper is from 2021, so 2021, um, where they were looking at the effect of the exploration parameter on cooperative games, on, on Q learning and cooperative games. Okay. And what they were doing is um, showing that games which have multiple equilibria initially uh, let me use a different color so they have um, multiple equilibria what happens um, so on the x and y axis you have the exploration rate for two agents okay and what happens is that these equilibria eventually 
there's this bifurcation that occurs um, where one of the equilibria is quote unquote destroyed by um, increasing the exploration rate sufficiently high. Um, and so if we follow this path where we start with a very, very low exploration, we increase it, then what happens is that there's this sharp transition in the Q-learning dynamics where when it was converging to one fixed point initially, it's now, there's now a bifurcation that occurs and a different fixed point becomes uh, globally stable. Okay. Um, and so you can use that actually to design uh, exploration uh, strategies, let's say, or exploration, what are they called? Uh, yeah, exploration modalities in which you increase the exploration, uh, you increase, increase, increase. Remember, we have complete control over what our exploration rates are. There's this bifurcation that occurs and then you can decrease the exploration rate again and you get this kind of hysteresis effect that occurs where you're now converging to a different equilibrium than you originally were, okay? So you can use this um, to your advantage. Now, what this requires, though, what this assumes is that if I choose my exploration, or let's say I choose my exploration rates for both agents to be something like this. So uh, no point. I choose temperatures 0.1 and uh, I choose time on uh, the other axis. But we can choose our exploration rate to be some parameter, okay? Then what ends up happening is we, we're assuming that the Q-learning dynamic will actually converge to this equilibrium, okay? And so on and so forth. As I keep changing my exploration rate, the assumption is that I actually will converge to an equilibrium, okay? But this isn't always going to be the case. In fact, we saw from before that non-equilibrium behaviors are perfectly valid. Um, the authors in this case were looking at specific examples in which we know that there's convergence to an equilibrium, but that's not always going to be the case. So what happens when we look at non-convergent behaviors or non-equilibrium behaviors? Then can we still understand what the effect of exploration is going to be? That's our, our next question, okay? Um, and when I say non-convergent behaviors, I mean limit cycles, I mean uh, chaotic behavior, which we have in the, the bottom right example. And we, we still wanna understand the effect of exploration. So in that light, we have uh, the following result. Okay, this is a little bit technical, but essentially what it uh, tells us, in fact, now let's get an intuition for it first. In this top picture, what we're doing, um, let's pick this color. There we go. In the top picture, we are increasing the temperature as we go from left to right, okay? And what's happening initially is we get this limit cycle that goes around the entire boundary of the simplex of a very, very, very big limit cycle. And what happens as we increase the temperature is that this limit cycle initially, it starts moving closer within the, uh, the interior of the simplex. So it's being pushed further away from the boundary of the simplex, okay? And as we continue increasing our temperature, we still get this limit cycle, but it's nice and compact in the, uh, the center of the simplex. To some degree, this makes sense um, because what it's saying is if we're, we're increasing our temperature parameter, we're essentially adjusting the strength of that softmax that we had from before, from the Boltzmann distribution. And so what that's telling us is we no longer have the option of choosing things with unit probability. We can no longer choose rock with unit probability because we've said that we are going to sample other actions, okay? But what we'd like to do is put some kind of um, guarantee on that. Uh, and that's exactly what this theorem achieves, okay? So the assumption that we make on the game is that the game has a unique 
so it's a QRE, but let's just call it equilibrium or a unique fixed point. Okay, it has a unique fixed point. That's the only assumption that we're making. Um, and what it tells us is that the Q-learning dynamics are going to converge to some set. Okay, and let's just quickly go over what this set is referring to. Um, I'm sure uh, most of you have, have come across the KL divergence before, but let's just quickly review it. Essentially, uh, the KL divergence is, I'm going to use this very, very loosely, so please don't get angry when I say this. Um, it's a measure of distance, and oh, let's say a notion of distance between two probability distributions, okay? Um, so what this is measuring is the distance between the equilibrium and my current, or, or the current uh, strategy of each agents, okay? Of, each, uh, of, of all the agents. And what this is, the theorem is saying is that this is going to be less than or equal to some upper bound, okay? So what we're saying is that uh, any, for any given temperature or any given exploration rate, we can't tell you that the system is going to converge to a fixed point, but we can define a, a neighborhood, loosely speaking, around the equilibrium that the Q-learning dynamics are going to converge to, okay? And what's interesting about that is that the size of the neighborhood depends on the temperature. So that if we increase the temperature, the size of this neighborhood ends up decreasing. So the, that the phenomena that we saw before where we have this initial um, system where the here learning dynamics essentially are just converging to the entirety of the simplex. As you increase the temperature parameter, the region to which the Q learning dynamics will eventually converge becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay. So this is some presents us with some kind of an advantage in terms of uh, understanding the convergence structure, even in the case where the system is not reaching a fixed point at the end. Um, so the dynamics could be doing whatever inside this region. We just know that it's going to be somewhere inside that uh, asymptotically. Um, so just um, to visualize that, uh, here we have a system, uh, we're, we're plotting the KL divergence on the, the Z axis from the equilibrium, which sits at the bottom to the entirety, <laughs> sorry, uh, the entirety of the simplex, okay? And each of these contour lines, they represent the upper bound defined in the theorem, okay, for different values of t. So that as I move inwards, let's just pick a different color. As I move inwards, or as I increase temperature, let's say, I contract the uh, state or the region of state space to which my Q-learning dynamics are converging, okay? Um, okay, any questions on that result? Amal, I have a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessarily focused on this result, but more like in the general picture of, of your research. Um, have you studied the relation between the equilibrium point or equilibrium region that you attain uh, in the probability of um, playing a certain action, right? With um, the equilibrium, the, the classic definition of an, a Nash equilibrium, right? That is more like in terms of guarantees on the cost. So when you attain an equilibrium, a Nash equilibrium, you're saying that by modifying the strategies, you unilaterally, you will attain a better reward for each of the players. Um, but in this case, when you attain this equilibrium for a specific uh, temperature, can you provide any kind of guarantees on the reward for each of the players? Have you studied that? Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So you're you're talking about when we don't have an equilibrium behavior, can we understand the the rewards that each agent is going to receive? Look. That, so you. So you. So you are attaining a different equilibrium for different values of k, of t. of t, right? Yeah. Have you seen what is the reward behavior? for each of those T's and if there is an improvement in the re general reward of the game based on the selection of T? That is a very interesting question. Uh, the answer is yes, and that we will get onto that very, very soon. Oh, awesome, in awesome, thank like you. Two minutes. Great, um, thanks. Yeah. All right, so, okay, so that's the convergence structure. Again, if there are any um, other questions, then please do just interrupt. Uh, and, and yell them out and I will answer them. Um, this is just another visualization of what that um, those regions look like so that we have this ball to which we are converging in uh, into. And you know we could be further inside that region. This is just a, 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 a larger picture essentially of uh, what the convergence structure is for the Q learning dynamics. Yeah. Okay, so we've seen so far that exploration is gonna force the dynamic further into the interior of the simplex, okay? Um, and if we push it high enough, the initial theorem told us that um, we will actually reach a unique fixed point. And um, now let's actually answer your question about the reward structure. Um, and the rewards that each agent receives and how that's dependent or that, how that's influenced by T. Uh, I have this slide on the exploration exploitation dilemma, but I think we've already covered it. Um, so let's just do the quick overview. Exploration um, essentially is a question about how often we're gonna sample our actions and exploitation um, essentially measures the, uh, or, is the tendency to maximize performance based on past results, okay? And the fundamental problem of reinforcement learning is how, how do we balance these two, all right? And we've seen that exploration from a dynamical perspective is about um, forcing the dynamics uh, into the interior of the simplex. I use delta to denote the simplex, okay? So let's have a look at the performance part of this. Remember, all of this is determined by the temperature parameter. Here's something that we noticed, that if we, um, okay, I don't have a slide on this, all right. Actually, let's, let's, let's explain it from this perspective, okay. Whilst we know that the dynamics are being forced into the interior of the simplex, what does that also mean? It means that the agents, in some sense, aren't able to access all of the payoff, let's say, that was available, initially available to them on the boundary of the simplex, okay? And it's a pretty uh, canonical result to say that um, especially in matrix games, which is what the majority of uh, our analysis looks at, the maximum payoff that any agent can receive is always on the boundary of the simplex, okay? And um, the reason why is because if you take, uh, like, let's say the rock, paper, scissors example again, okay? If we take rock, paper, scissors, uh, and I'm playing paper 100% of the time, then it is better for you to play scissors 100% of the time than it is to play at 50% of the time, right? Because that, that way you're maximizing your payoff. But what exploration does is by constricting where in the state space you're allowed to be, and that, that strictly has to be further away from the boundary, it means you no longer have the ability to play scissors 100% of the time. And now you're missing out on all of that payoff that you could have been achieving, all right? And the way that we, measure that is through this parameter here, TSW, which I did have a slide, but I think I must have got rid of it. Um, 
It's called the total social welfare. Okay. Um, what does this measure? This, oh, sorry. My bad. Time average social welfare. Um, okay, the time average social welfare, let, let's have a look at the social welfare part of this. What this does is it takes all the payoffs to all agents and just adds them all together. Okay, so if we have, uh, okay, uh, we'll use rock, paper, scissors again. If we use rock, paper, scissors as an example, then um, let's say by playing, you playing rock, you receive five pounds and I lose three pounds. Then we sum up all the payoffs uh, and if it's five and three. So the, the total social welfare is gonna be two pounds. Okay, because I've added all of the, uh, the payoffs together. In a zero sum game, for example, uh, like Prisoner's Dilemma, then social welfare is always zero and it's not a particularly interesting um, uh, metric to measure. But in general, the social welfare is not going to be zero. Okay, and what our interest is in saying is saying, how does the social welfare, um, how is the social welfare changed by an increase in temperature? Okay, and intuitively, we, at least I, I, I think it's intuitive to say that the performance in terms of social welfare goes down because of what we said before, the agents are no longer able to maximize their payoff. Therefore, the total payoff has to decrease. Yeah. Um, and so we see in experiment that uh, in this particular example, that as we're increasing temperature, uh, the system is converging tighter and tighter and tighter into the interior of the simplex. But at the same time, the total social welfare is decreasing as a result. Okay. Um, and if we take this even further, then uh, that particular game, we saw this to be a general phenomena. So here we're just generating random uh, games again and again for different numbers of agents. Uh, capital N, little n is the number of actions that they have available to them. Um, and what we're doing is basically measuring, uh, the black line measures the, let's say the convergence um, of the Q-learning dynamic, so that as we increase the expiration rate, the agents are converging more and more and more and more and more, right? As we saw in uh, these, these examples, yeah? But as a result, what this red line measures is the social welfare uh, or the time average social welfare. So when I say time average, what we're doing is we're uh, looking along the Q learning dynamic and then taking the average uh, at the end. Um, and so the time average social welfare along these dynamics is decreasing and it's decreasing uh, mon monotonically. Okay, and this seems to be a general phenomena that we um, observe across a wide range of games. Now we were actually able to prove it for a very specific game. This is called the Shapley game. So in the Shapley game, um, it, the details again aren't important. We were actually able to prove that as you increase the temperature, the system moves towards equilibrium, but as a result, you uh, lose out on the time average social welfare. Um, and then in experiment, we were able to see that as a, as a general phenomenon. Okay. And um, so that in essence became our um, hypothesis for what the effect of exploration is. Exploration pushes the dynamics into the interior of the simplex. And as a result, there is a loss of system performance as measured by social welfare. Okay. So it could be the case that one agent is doing very, very well by um, moving towards equilibrium, but the system as a whole is suffering. Okay. Um, and that leads us on to the open questions and I've managed to keep this to the hour, so I'm very proud of myself. 
Um, there's a lot of interesting um, topics in that. Like I said, the general result regarding social welfare, um, we've only seen experimentally. We haven't been able to prove that link generally. Um, and so that's something that we're really looking to do at the moment or find counter examples. Uh, there's a complete possibility that such counter examples, even though that they would be sparse, they could exist. Um, so, for example, a similar work was done in 2014. Um, it was one of Sebastian von Strain's works where they were looking at a different learning algorithm and they found a counterexample in which these non convergent uh, dynamics were actually doing worse in terms of social welfare than the equilibrium behaviors. But uh, even in that paper, they had this hypothesis that the, uh, this sample space, uh, if that's the correct word to use, of such games must be very, very, very low. Uh, this is based on experiment. Okay, so we'd like to either prove that link or find some counter examples. Um, another thing that I find quite interesting, and this is something that we're looking at at the moment again, um, is this final point of, we know that we have access to an agent's exploration rate. Okay, and we also know that the exploration rate affects the dynamics. So moving from a dynamical systems analysis of the algorithm, we can start actually considering the exploration rate as a control parameter. And if we can do that, uh, and we have this understanding of the dynamics, then perhaps we're actually, we could actually um, influence the outcome of our learning behaviors. There's been works already that have looked at that. So I mentioned one before where they increase the exploration rate and then decrease it again to move from one uh, Nash equilibrium to another. Um, and so what we'd like to do is see how that could be uh, shown in general. Um, but there are a lot of other um, interesting directions that I've listed out here and ones that perhaps you, you, you can think of better than me. Um, but that's, those are the results that we have uh, so far and the directions that we're looking to go to. So thank you all for listening. Uh, and if there are any questions, feel free to shout them out now. All right, thank you very much, Emma. Uh, any other questions? Also to whoever uh, it was, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, um, who asked about the, uh, the reward structure. Does the slides that we just went over answer your question? um yeah kind of um yes i'm santiago i'm the one asking you ah, so um i saw that you were connecting it to the to, to, to total performance of the system yeah yeah and i was just wondering if there was any, any way of um finding some sort of uh equilibrium solution in terms of the best performance of the system for certain selection of T, but I, but I think you already answered that that's an open problem. So, so yeah, yeah. Um, that's interesting. I mean, the way that I kind of think about it sometimes is, um, and maybe this is a little bit defeatist, but I don't think it is necessarily going to be a case where. Um, okay, let me put it this way. I think there's always going to be a trade-off between um, convergence and optimality of the system. Um, so it's going to be rare that we think about a case where there's a, a best case equilibrium behavior, but rather the best cases are generally where there's no equilibrium behavior whatsoever. Um, and so there is a decision that needs to be made on the behalf of, on the part of the practitioner to decide, do we care about uh, system performance or do we care about um, system convergence and um, and placing guarantees on system behavior. And that is a pretty open question, uh, in my opinion. One question. Yeah. yeah. What do you mean by system performance? Do you take into account reliability there? Um, so by system performance, I am generally referring to social welfare. Um, so the sum of payoffs to all agents. Um, but we can also think about it um, 
and it, just extending that uh, idea. If our agents, instead of trying to maximize uh, payoff, they're trying to minimize the cost, then the social welfare is just inverted, right? Uh, so it's the total cost. Okay, thanks. Okay, right. other questions or comments? All right, okay, thank you, Amel, uh, again, and then we uh, probably have other talks by Amel uh, in the near future. Yeah, thank you, Al. thank you, Zan.